flanked by the church, the rectory, and the people's homes, stands the inn. In its shade and beneath its roof, men of all degrees and of all opinions meet in comradeship and comfort. Walk through any English market town and you'll find the inn at the centre of its life. On market day, the people from the country around meet there to discuss the trend of prices, their children's health and their home affairs. It's the same in the villages. When the sun warms the earth, they sit outside and watch the world go by. At the English inn today, there is a hospitality that to the host is just as much a sacred charge as it was to the monks and barons in the Middle Ages who first gave bread and ale to travellers. Often the only sanctuary in out-of-the-way parts, the monasteries had a lodge open to pilgrims and other wayfarers. these lodges became separate establishments and were eventually run as inns under such signs as the Pilgrim's Inn. One example of monastic origin is the bull, which gets its name from the papal bull or bill, not the animal. These inns of England have seen history happen in their yards. Pilgrims and warriors have trodden their stairways. Here medieval knights refreshed themselves on their journeys to the Crusades to fight under the banner of St. George. The inns have preserved much of England's architecture. The early inn has preserved some of the finest carvings and treasures. Like the church, it was a sanctuary. Hence, most of these carvings have a religious meaning. Side by side with the monastic inns grew the royal inns, which were used by the king's servants when travelling in the Middle Ages. A house in each village was selected for their accommodation. These two in time became commercial inns under such ancient signs as the crown. Later, the inn yard was used by the post boy as a link between villages and hamlets. The mails in turn were carried by stagecoach further afield and today much of our civilization can be traced back to these earlier forms of communication which centered round the inn. As the inns grew more important, their yards grew larger and galleries were added. These formed a convenient theatre for strolling players, who often used the inn for refreshment after their performance. By the beginning of the 19th century, coach travel had become more popular, and the tavern was used as a coaching station. There, luggage was assembled and passengers would be taken aboard prior to the long drive across the English countryside. Coaches built for speed used the inns as halts, where fresh teams of horses were changed in a matter of seconds. Today, beneath the sign of the old coach and horses, you'll find bicycles. While on the road, cars pass old toll gates, where once fees were collected for the upkeep of the main road. When the railway brought speed to industrial England, it also brought the new railway taverns. You'll also find the inn on the banks of the English waterways, our oldest transport routes. The cargoes which float past have changed with the centuries. Sail has given way to steam and the petrol motor. The inn signs themselves reflect a great variety of topical humour, interests, sports and history. The load of mischief, a dig at the nagging wife. The volunteer, from the days when warfare was more casual. The White Hart, crest of King Richard II. England's St George fighting the dragon. And England's St George refreshing himself afterwards. The Six Bells with its two meanings. The row barge to remind us of more leisurely days 
and the cross-handed highwaymen of when our roads weren't so safe. The fighting cocks, memories of an old English sport, and the airmen to bring our inn signs right up to date. Travel along the English road today and you'll find the modern inn, there to refresh all travellers according to their means. Its appearance and amenities differ widely from the village tavern, but its roots are the same. It merely reflects the temper and taste of a new and swifter age. The inn parlour today is used by the local people for communal purposes of a different kind. Air raid wardens use it as their meeting place to discuss how to tackle a new type of incendiary bomb. In the back room of another inn, members of the local fire service are learning how to use some new equipment. And all over the country, people come once a week to their local tavern to pay their small contribution into the war savings group. The Home Guard have used the inn as a meeting place ever since they were a small eager body of men hastily organized for home defense. Today, well armed and trained, the inn is still their meeting place. The inn has changed very little in appearance and hardly at all in its amenities. The contents of its cellar are not so expensive, but quite adequate for this less indulgent age. Oliver Goldsmith wrote of the inn that it was a place where greybeard mirth from smiling toil retired, where village statesmen talked with looks profound, and news much older than their ale went round. Rich and poor, young and old, the English inn has housed them all and greets them still. For hospitality, tolerance and companionship are ageless. And at the inn, each of them is merely a new arrival at a feast that never ends.